Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Paris to this session titled Targeting Her to Low Expression in Breast Cancer, Evaluating the Evidence, Challenges and Opportunities for Expanding Treatment Benefit to More Patients. I welcome all of you that are here in person and also I welcome all the uh, people connected online that are also following uh, this, this session. For those of you that do not know me, I'm Dr. Alex Prat. I'm a me breast medical oncologist based in Barcelona, Spain. And it's my pleasure, I'm not alone, as you can see. It is my pleasure to be with two friends and colleagues, experts in the field. On one hand, we have Dr. Shanu Modi from Memorial Sloan Kettering. And also we have Dr. Paolo uh, Tarantino, uh, a research fellow at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, in the US. Today's agenda. Today's agenda is going to be um, broken, down, broken down by uh, four different sections. We're going to have three talks. Uh, Dr. Paolo Tarantino will give, will talk about the foundation uh, concepts of her to low breast cancer, the challenges and the opportunities of an evolving uh, definition. Dr. Shannon Modi will talk about extending anti her to therapy benefits to a larger population of patients emerging evidence, implementation in clinical practice, and also some insights about the future directions. And finally, I'll be talking more about the biology of her to low disease. And at the end, we're gonna have, again, a nice session where we can discuss uh, among us and also with your collaboration about this topic. So without uh, delay, let's get started with the first uh, talk. Thank you, Alex, for this kind presentation, and thank you to everybody for joining us this morning. So, I'll start this off by discussing HER2 in general, and HER2 is a receptor that is physiologically expressed on cell membranes of nearly all tissues in the body, including the breast, the skin, the lungs, GI system, placenta, and urinary tract. And similarly, nearly all breast cancers also express HER2 to some degree. And the detectability of HER2 depends on the type of tissue that you analyze and what's the sensitivity of the assay that you use to analyze it. In, back in the 80s, Sleman and colleagues identified a strong prognostic impact for RB2 amplifications, and they discovered also that RB2 amplification of the gene led to overexpression of the HER2 receptor on the membrane in the order of millions of receptors for each cancer cell. And her 2 positive once again, her 2 positive breast cancer was this subset of very aggressive disease with shorter DFS and OS compared to her 2 negative tumors. Her 2 is a tyrosine kinase, uh, tyrosine kinase receptor that upon homo or heterodimerization with other partners promotes the proliferation, survival, and invasiveness of tumor cells. However, blocking the HER2 receptor with trastuzumab in the beginning and with many other agents afterwards really changed the, the pathway of the disease of HER2-positive breast cancer, turning it from the most aggressive to one of the most treatable and curable subtypes of breast cancer. And nowadays, we have eight anti-HER2 agents that are approved to treat either early or advanced HER2-positive breast cancer with approvals both in the early and advanced settings. And once again, this really changed the history of disease what once was a very uh, a disease with a very short overall survival, this is in the metastatic setting, in the years really changed to one of the diseases that we treat better. So moving on, the, um, as I said, 15 to 20 percent of tumors are HER2 positive, but 80 percent of tumors have been defined HER2 negative for about two decades or more because they lack the amplification of the HER2 oncogene, and despite lacking the amplification. Most of these tumors do have some HER2 expression that can be detected with immunohistochemistry, and this means thousands of HER2 receptors on the cell membrane. And despite that, there has been no approved in tier 2 agent between 2000 and 2021 for this subset of tumors. And the question is, could they benefit from HER2 blockade? And there was a retrospective analysis of an adjuvant trastuzumab trial that suggested so, that seemed to look at those tumors that were actually HER2 negative, and were wrongly defined HER2 positive and included in the trial, and they seem to benefit from trastuzumab. And this observation led to the design of a large phase three randomized trial, the NSABP B47, that randomized node positive or uh, high risk node negative breast cancer with HER2 low expression defined as IHC 1 plus or 2 plus fish negative, <coughs> standard adjuvant chemotherapy, 
or adjuvant chemotherapy plus trastuzumab, and there was actually no benefit in terms of IDFS or overall survival in this population for the addition of trastuzumab, and this was observed in all the subgroups. There was no benefit from targeting her low expression with trastuzumab alone. And also when pertuzumab, was tested in a metastatic setting among a um, population of largely HER2 low metastatic breast cancer patients. There was only a response rate of 2.5%, a time for progression of 1.5 months, once again suggesting that there is no clinical benefit with the blockade of the HER2 pathway in HER2 low breast cancer. However, in the last decade, we've been developing new anterior 2 pharmacological agents, and among these, antibody drug conjugates have reshaped the paradigm of HER2 low. The first one to be tested was also the first one to be approved for breast cancer, for her to positive breast cancer, but in her to low breast cancer, it didn't seem as active. There was only one response out of 21 patients with her to negative disease and a median PFS of 2.6 months. However, novel antibody drug conjugates that have been designed have higher drug to antibody ratio, so a higher number of chemo molecules attached to each antibody, cleavable linkers allowing the payload to diffuse outside of the antibody and novel payloads that act in different ways that can be also lipophilic and so it can surpass the tumor membranes and reach other cells and achieve the so-called bystander healing effect. And we're going to discuss today a lot about trastuzumab deruxican and this was tested in a phase one trial that had many expansion cords, and among these there was one expansion cord for her too low metastatic breast cancer defined as IHC 1 plus or 2 plus each negative. And in this cohort, among patients that had been treated with a median of 7.5 lines, patients achieved um, the trastuzumab druxic can achieve a response rate of 37% with activity both in IHC 1 plus and 2 plus and a median PFS of 11 months that was really impressive in this highly pretreated population. And responses, once again, were observed both in 1 plus and 2 plus, patients pretreated with CDK46 inhibitors, and patients with or without prior receipt of anterior 2 treatment, because a small subset of patients had also received anterior 2 treatments prior to entering the trial. And also, other ADCs have shown activity in her 2 low disease. Trastuzumab duocarmazine and decidumab bedotin have both shown between 30 and 40% response rate in her 2 low metastatic breast cancer with a PFS of about four to six months. So this really led to identify this intermediate subset of tumors that are not HER2 amplified, not HER2 positive or expressing, but they do have some HER2 immunohistochemical expression, 1 plus or 2 plus H negative. And so these tumors that have been treated with those ADCs in the phase one trial, we called back in 2020 HER2 low. And this accounts for about half of all metastatic breast cancer, but also early breast cancers. And the important thing is that this depends on hormone receptor expression because it's more likely to find HER2 low tumors among hormone receptor positive tumors, about two thirds of all hormone receptor positive tumors are too low, compared to 30 to 40% of triple negative tumors that are HER2 low. And actually recently, we looked at our Dana-Farber cohort and we found that this is a kind of continuous uh, degree of expression because in triple negative breast cancer, as we said, 40% are HER2 low, but if you look at ER low from one to 9% expression of the estrogen receptor, it's 46 and it slowly progresses till the highest expressors, expressors of estrogen receptor. Among the highest expressors, more than 95% ER, you have 62% that are HER2 low. And you could ask, is HER2 low expression prognostic? And this is still an open question. However, many studies have been conducted. We have also looked at that in the Dana-Farber cohort, and we didn't find a clinically meaningful prognostic value for this biomarker. And in most of the studies, there was no meaningful impact on prognosis in terms of survival. And so there was no benefit with blocking HER2 low with trastuzumab and no distinct prognosis, but still there is encouraging activity with the delivery of cytotoxic payload through ADCs. And this activity is not likely related to a blockade of the HER2 pathway, but to a targeted delivery of a highly potent payload. So let's move to the challenges. One important challenge is that compared to HER2 positive disease, to HER2 amplified disease that usually retains the amplification in time, except for some exceptions, HER2 low is highly variable in time. And so you can have a tumor that is HER2 zero on the primary that becomes HER2 low on the metastatic setting and the opposite way around. 
And there are many reasons that could account for this, like analytical factor, HER2 expression, heterogeneity, biologic evolution of the disease. And another aspect that could lead to this is the high discordance among pathologies in defining zero to one plus, because this threshold, zero one plus, never had any clinical meaningfulness. It was not important to select treatment for the patient. And now that it is, we have a problem, because when we talk of HER2 zero, we're not talking of tumors that do not express HER2 for current ASCOCAP guidelines, but we're talking of tumors either with no staining or with membrane staining that is incomplete and faint, barely perceptible in 10% of tumor cells. So you can have tumors that do express some HER2, but are called HER2 zero. And so let's move back to the definition of HER2, which is another important challenge. Because if you look at a static definition at one tumor, you score HER2 and you can say if that tumor is HER2 zero, HER2 low, HER2 positive. But in the clinic, we see patients that have multiple biopsies in time, have multiple samples in time. And so you could have a patient that was HER2 one plus on the primary tumor and then became HER2 zero you know, on the metastatic setting. And we've seen this in many studies that it can happen in 20 to 40% of the cases. And then maybe after a biopsy after endocrine treatment is still HER2 zero, but if the biopsy after chemo is one plus now, and at the end, you're willing to use TDX data is now approved in, in the US, but the tumor at the last biopsy is HER2 zero. So is this tumor HER2 zero or HER2 low? And there is no right answer to this question, but I'll give you my opinion. In my opinion, um, uh, given the complexities of HER2 low pathologic definition, and also some suggestions of activity in this HER2 zero category that we're gonna see in the next presentation by Dr. Modi. For me, a HER2 low tumor in clinical practice is a HER2 non-amplified tumor that showed HER2 low expression on any prior specimen in the course of disease. And if you use this definition, then let's look back to the evolution of HER2 low. In the, um, in the primary tumor, you, you have about half of the tumors that are HER2 low. But then if you biopsy in the metastatic setting, you expect some tumor to retain HER2 low expression. You, express, you expect some HER2 zero tumors to become HER2 low, and then you expect some HER2 low tumors to become HER2 zero, but we still call them HER2 low because they have been HER2 low in the past. And so if you look at this, now we have 81% of the tumors that are HER2 low. And this means that given this definition, if you use this definition in clinical practice, the rate of HER2 low tumors increases progressively with each, each additional biopsy. The third and last challenge, which is, which is actually a good challenge that we're facing, is that we're expanding the reach of ADCs in a larger population, also to what we call ultra-low. As I said, you do have um, HER2 zero tumors that express some minimal um, immunohistochemical expression of HER2, and there is a large trial, Destiny Breast 06, that is slightly different from Destiny Breast 04 that we're going to also discuss today because it's larger, is restricted to hormone receptor positive disease, and includes chemo naive patients. But one important difference is that it also includes this subset 150 patients that have HER2 zero disease with minimal detectability of HER2, what we call ultra low. And so we have recently moved from this traditional pie chart of HER2, which includes about 20% of tumors that are HER2 positive and 80 to 85 that are HER2 negative towards a new, a different pie chart that includes also a HER2, a large HER2 low subset of cancers that can be targeted with ADCs, although they do not, don't have a different biology or a different prognosis. But now we could, with Destiny Breast 06 and other trials that are being tested in this population, we could further expand this pie chart to ultra low tumors that are HER2 zero, but do have some expression of HER2. And finally, also Dr. Pratt is gonna discuss about many quantitative assays that are being tested and developed to better assess HER2 low expression. And we might reach a moment where we have a continuous expression, continuous spectrum of HER2 low expression that can help us select patients for novel ADCs. So in conclusion, my take home messages are that about half of all breast cancer exhibit low expression, low HER2 low expression, if you look at a static time point. However, the rate of HER2-low tumors is much higher if you consider any sample tested in the course of disease, and there is no clinically meaningful no, prognostic value oh, for okay. the moment for HER2-low expression, and no clinical benefit has been achieved by blocking HER2-pathway in HER2-low tumors, 
but novel antibody drug conjugate can deliver highly potent cytotoxin toward her two low expression cells with clinically irrelevant activity observed in the metastatic setting. The diagnosis of her two low remains challenging, given that IHC scoring was never developed to dissect her two low expression, and the emergence of novel HER2 assays and results from ongoing trials like Destiny Presto 6 may change our definition of HER2 low in the years to come. We will need extensive flexibility to adapt to future evolution of the definition of HER2 low. And with this, I'll pass it on to my colleague, Dr. Modi. So I, thank you, Paolo. You set the stage, I think, really nicely for my talk. So, uh, you know, HER2 low may not be its own unique subtype of breast cancer, as we just heard, but it certainly is a targetable subgroup, and it's really defined by its sensitivity to the new generation of antibody drug conjugates and sort of leading or the pioneer agent uh, of this exciting new frontier is really trastuzumab deruxtecan or TDXD for short. So just to compare TDXD to our prototype HER2 ADC, which is TDM1, uh, you know, both of these uh, have the HER2 monoclonal antibody as the backbone, uh, but they have very different linker and payload technology. So, uh, TDXD, I think, has some unique and advanced pharmaceutical properties, starting with its payload, which is a topoisomerase 1 inhibitor, which is a very novel chemo for breast cancer. It also has twice as many chemo molecules linked to each antibody, and so it delivers a lot more chemotherapy to the cancer cells. And then finally, and probably most importantly, it has a cleavable linker, which allows it to induce the bystander effect. And I think many of you have seen this slide before, but it illustrates quite nicely this concept. So when the antibody of the ADC binds its target, which in this case is HER2, the whole antigen ADC complex is internalized, and then within the cell, the chemotherapy is released, allowing it to kill the HER2-positive cancer cell. And this is where most ADCs stop working, like TDM1. But in the case of TDXD, the chemotherapy can now pass through the cell membrane and enter the tumor microenvironment and, and now has the potential to act on neighboring cells, including cells that may have variable or low levels of HER2 expression. And this is called the bystander effect. And it's a very unique and key feature of TDXD. And really, this is what allows it to be active in tumors beyond HER2 positive breast cancer. So shown here is some preclinical work uh, comparing TDM1 and TDXD in cell lines and PDX models. And on the bottom, you can see that TDM1 is extremely active in tumors with high levels of HER2 expression, those three plus cancers, as shown by the dark blue bars. And this is what we, we know to expect from it. On the top, you see, however, TDXD first of all, is active in a broad range of tumor types. And not only is it active in the three plus cancers, it also has strong activity in the two plus and one plus cancers as well. And so capitalizing on this uh, feature, uh, we conducted a phase one study of TDXD in, in a heavily pretreated cohort of patients with HER2 low metastatic breast cancer. And as you can see here, True to the preclinical work, TDXD had very strong activity with an overall response rate of 37%. And we saw fairly similar activity between the 2 plus and 1 plus cancers. And that benefit was also very durable. So these were exciting data. It's the first time we saw such strong activity for a HER2 targeted agent for this population of patients. Uh, and and uh, this is what then led us, and, and I should actually say this is also I think much stronger activity than we would have expected from standard of care therapy for, for this kind of a pretreated population as well. And so this is what led to the jump from a phase one trial to the randomized phase three Destiny Breast 04 study. And as you all know, we presented this at the ASCO plenary. So this is the first randomized phase three study of TDXD versus physician's choice of chemotherapy for patients with HER2 low metastatic breast cancer. And this was an open label, multi-center, multi-nation trial. And it enrolled patients with centrally confirmed HER2 low metastatic breast cancer. 
and patients uh, were required to have at least one, but not more than two lines of chemotherapy to be eligible. And those patients with hormone receptor positive HER2 low breast cancer were additionally required to have a disease that was considered endocrine refractory. Uh, all, all patients had, of course, centrally confirmed HER2 low status in their tumors, and this was defined using the ASCO CAP uh, definitions of IHC 1 plus or 2 plus without gene amplification. So patients were randomized 2 to 1 to TDXD, given at the standard dose we use in breast cancer, versus physician's choice of chemotherapy. And, and you can see that the choices really include some of the most commonly used chemotherapies for this setting. Uh, in the, the primary endpoint of the trial was progression-free survival by a, a blinded investigator uh, review, and this was in the hormone-positive population. Uh, this is the predominant population within the HER2 low uh, subtype or subgroup of breast cancer, almost in a ratio of 8 to 1 or 9 to 1. So predominantly, it is a hormone-positive HER2 low population. So we uh, then went on to do, in a hierarchical fashion, uh, the secondary endpoints, which then included the PFS for all patients, now including a small population of hormone receptor negative HER2 low uh, breast cancer patients, and then similarly overall survival for the hormone positive and then all patients on trial. The plan was to enroll 540 HER2 low patients, uh, 480 with hormone positive HER2 low breast cancer, and 60 with hormone receptor negative. Again, trying to replicate what is the natural uh, pre preponderance of these two subgroups within HER2 low breast cancer. And so these were the results. We did enroll 557 patients, 373 were randomized to TDXD, and 184 to the physician's choice of chemotherapy. I think it's really interesting to see that most physicians chose to deliver aribulin as a standard chemo, and we know that that's a very effective chemotherapy for metastatic breast cancer, maybe one of our most effective. So I think it makes the comparator arm uh, a very robust uh, control. Overall, the two arms on the trial were quite well balanced. In total, there were 89% of the patients were hormone receptor positive, uh, HER2 low patients, and about 11% were hormone receptor negative, so a smaller group of what we also call triple negative breast cancer patients. In terms of prior therapies, the uh, patients on average received a median of three lines in the metastatic setting. 60% of patients had one line of prior chemotherapy and 40% had two prior lines. Looking at the hormone positive group, they had a median of two lines of prior endocrine therapy and 70% of the patients did receive prior CDK4-6 inhibitor therapy. Overall, 60% of the tumors were, uh, had an IHC score of one plus and approximately 40% had two plus-ish negative cancers. And these are the efficacy results, starting with PFS in the hormone receptor positive cohort. And this was the primary endpoint of the trial. And you can see on the left, uh, there's a clear advantage for TDXD with a hazard ratio of 0 0.51 and with a median and a significant p-value and a median PFS improved from 5.4 months to 10.1 months in favor of TDXD. On the right are the curves for the full study population, now including the hormone receptor negative cases. And again, very similar or nearly identical results with a hazard of 0 0.5 and an improvement in PFS from five months to 10 months. So overall, TDXD decreases the risk of progression uh, by approximately 50%. Overall survival was a key secondary endpoint, and so again on the left for the hormone receptor positive cohort, the hazard ratio for OS was 0.64, it was a significant hazard ratio, and on the right for all patients on the trial, again similar hazard, 0.64, uh, which really is a 6.6 month absolute gain in overall survival. And just to put it in context, as, as we all know, treating breast cancer, that it's very rare to see a survival advantage with the introduction of new therapies in the, in the later line metastatic setting. So these are actually really exceptional uh, efficacy data. 
And finally, this is an exploratory analysis looking at those, uh, that small group of the triple negative population within this trial, those with hormone receptor negative HER2 low breast cancer. Uh, and you can see the results are very similar to the overall study results. So the hazards were 0 0.46 and 0 0.48 uh, for PFS and OS respectively in this group. Um, and this, you know, over, we know this is a, a much more poor prognosis population. And so the absolute numbers are lower. The, the median PFS with standard chemotherapy is only 2.9 months. And this improved to over eight months with TDXD. In terms of overall survival, the median OS with standard chemotherapy is about eight months. And this more than doubled with TDXD to 18 months. So very clinically, I think, relevant and important results in a high-risk population. Uh, the subgroup analysis, I think, really nicely shows uh, that, that uh, the strength of TDXD in all, in all categories. In particular, uh, we saw similar benefits for patients who did or did not receive prior CDK4-6 inhibitors, for patients who had IHC 1 plus or 2 plus cancers, and also for patients who had either one or two lines of chemotherapy. These are the safety, uh, safety summary, and really there were no surprises um, with using TDXD in a HER2 low population. It had a very similar profile to what we are used to seeing in the HER2 positive patients. Uh, overall, the toxicities are GI in nature or bone marrow suppression. The most common toxicity is nausea. Thankfully, it's mostly grades one and two. And I think ex with experience now, we know that this can be well managed with the use of prophylactic antiemetics. Of course, uh, lung, interstitial lung disease or lung toxicity is a very important toxicity of TDXD. Um, and you can see here in this trial, about 12% of patients had some degree of lung toxicity. Again, thankfully, the majority were low-grade events, um, but there, were, uh, there was a 0.8% incidence of uh, grade five events with three reported deaths. So again, an important reminder that, that this is a drug that requires vigilance and prompt intervention to minimize these high-grade lung, lung events. Overall, there were no concerning cardiac sing signals in this trial. Uh, we did see some uh, largely low-grade EF declines and uh, some rare uh, re but, but re and reversible uh, cases of, of cardiac failure. These are really in the range of what we see with trastuzumab in our HER2-positive population. So I think for most of us, we're familiar with how to monitor and manage patients on this kind of therapy. Overall, I think the Destiny Breast 04 trial really is the definitive trial for the HER2 low uh, breast cancer population. Uh, and it reached both its primary and secondary endpoints. And it really is a groundbreaking trial for a number of reasons. I think first and foremost, this was the first uh, drug or agent to show such strong activity in a HER2 low population. Uh, and in fact, it, it proved to have a survival advantage over our standard therapies. I think this trial also establishes that HER2 low is a targetable population, and TDXD is the current standard of care for, for this population of patients. And finally, these data really have, have the potential to impact almost half of our patients diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer today. So it is a, I think, paradigm changing and practice changing trial for those reasons. And I think it does compel us to now think about HER2 beyond our binary classification uh, and to think more precisely about the actual level of HER2 expression. And so for, for, for those patients that have three plus or two plus amplified breast cancers, we still call these HER2 positive breast cancers and they're uh, candidates for all our currently available HER2 targeted therapies. For those patients who have IHC scores of zero, these are our HER2 negative patients, and today we still uh, have no HER2 targeted agents uh, for this group of patients. And then, of course, based on the Destiny 4, for the 1 plus, 2 plus non amplified uh, cases, we now have uh, the ability to offer trastuzumab drugs to can to this sort of newly coined group of HER2 low breast cancer. Just jump now to future directions. So, I think the HER2 low space is still actually a very much evolving arena, 
And shown here are some really provocative results from the DAISY trial, which is a really critical phase two study uh, trying to understand mechanisms uh, behind TDXD. And as you can see here in one of the cohorts of this study, uh, in patients with HER2 breast cancers with IHC scores of zero, we saw a very interesting 30% response rate with TDXD. Uh, this was a, a bit of a surprise, uh, and it's left some skeptics asking, you know, is TDXD really a HER2-targeted therapy? Uh, do we actually need to know the HER2 status of cancers, or can we give this drug to all breast cancer patients? I think to address this question, it's really first uh, and foremost important to appreciate the fact that IHC zero does not mean an absence of HER2. Even by our current ASCOCAP guidelines, uh, it means less than 10% of cells have some evidence of HER2 staining. And if we use a more sensitive quantitative measurement tool, in this case mass spec, you can see that there really is a gradient of HER2 expression across the IHC scores. So that you can see even on the far left, even IHC zero cancers do have some HER2 present. And if we look at, at this um, using our new classification, you can see a really big difference between the HER2 positive, the three plus cases, and all other breast cancer. Um, but there's a much subtle, much more subtle difference between IHC two plus and one plus, the HER2 lows, and IHC zero. And I think this really reflects what we saw in the clinical trials in Destiny 4 and also what we're seeing in the DAISY study. So from my perspective, I think the relevant question is, uh, what is the lowest threshold of HER2 needed to activate TDXD? And maybe we need more sensitive tools uh, for defining the, the HER2 status for this new generation of antibody drug conjugates. And trying to address that is the Destiny Breast 06 trial, as Paolo referred to as well. This is another randomized phase three study for HER2 low metastatic breast cancer patients. Now, this is a, 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 in a cohort of patients without prior chemotherapy, so less pretreated than Destiny 4. And it includes a group of patients that we are now calling HER2 ultra low. And those are tumors that have less than one plus, but more than zero HER2 by IHC. And so this may get, give us a little more clarity as to what is that lower threshold for HER2 low or lower boundary. Another very important ongoing study in the HER2 low space is the Destiny Breast 08 trial. Uh, perhaps some of you are investigators on this study. It is a platform study looking uh, at, at HER2 low metastatic breast cancer in, uh, in, and providing combinations with TDXD, including combinations that have uh, IO therapy and other targeted agents. So uh, hoping to try and improve the outcomes with TDXD for a greater number of patients with HER2 low breast cancer. Also another important ongoing study is the Begonia trial, another platform study. This is for triple negative breast cancer, and it's looking at the checkpoint inhibitor Dervalumab in different combinations. And there is one arm of this trial for the HER2 low triple negative breast cancer population. And we saw some results for Dervalumab plus TDXD. And as you can see here, some really impressive early results, strong response rates in both the PDL1 positive and PDL1 negative patients. So an important combination to keep our eye on. And also enrolling is the neoadjuvant talent trial, and this is for early stage hormone positive HER2 low breast cancer, where patients are being randomized to either TDXD or TDXD plus aromatase inhibitor therapy. On the heels of trastuzumab, Durexacan are a number of other promising uh, HER2 targeting ADCs that have also shown promising activity in the HER2 low population. On the top is trastuzumab, duocarmazine, previously called SYD985. And on the bottom is decidumab, vedotin, previously called RC48. These are both ADCs that have cleavable linkers. So again, we presume the benefits are related to a bystander effect here. And we're seeing pretty consistent response rates ranging between 30 to 40%. Both of these drugs are now in additional trials in the HER2 low setting. 
uh, SYD 985 is in combination with paclitaxel, and it's also part of the iSpy neoadjuvant program. Uh, and decidumab vedotin is also in a phase three trial comparing it to standard of care chemotherapy, very much uh, like the design of the Destiny Breast 04. There are yet other agents in testing for the HER2 low setting, so we hope in the future to have more tools in, in the armamentarium for this uh, population of patients. Recently, we did see the results of the Tropics 2 study presented. This was presented at ASCO, uh, and uh, this is a randomized trial for patients with hormone-positive, HER2-negative metastatic breast cancer, pretreated at least two lines of chemotherapy, uh, and compared to standard of care chemotherapy, sazituzumab uh, gobitikan, which as we all know is a trope 2 targeting antibody drug conjugate, showed superior PFS uh, results with a hazard ratio of 0.66. And at this meeting, we will be seeing the positive overall survival results presented. So very exciting. Um, this uh, is already a, an ADC we are familiar with from the triple negative setting. And we may now have uh, an approval for the hormone positive, uh, HER2 negative metastatic population as well. Uh, and so all of this um, advancement in ADC therapy is, of course, raising a, a, an interesting clinical issue for us, uh, which is how do we select and choose and sequence these ADCs, for, particularly for populations that are overlapping? And so, you know, very soon we may have the, the ability to offer both sasituzumab and TDXD to, the, to an overlapping population within the HER2 negative population. Uh, and so, so how do we choose? And, and to add to the complexity, while they target different antigens, they have a similar payload. They have a topoisomerase 1 inhibitor payload. Uh, so does it even make sense to sequence these two? Or... Uh, to add one more layer of complexity, there are yet a number of new ADCs in the pipeline, some with similar antigen targets and some with similar payloads. Uh, how do we factor those in? And there are yet more in the pipeline. So this question uh, is going to come up again and again. I think what it's clear what we need in this space are uh, novel and additional biomarkers and a deeper understanding of the mechanisms of resistance to these ADCs in order to, I think, rationally select therapy for our patients. Uh, and, and currently, without the benefit of sequencing studies or comparison studies, we're really left making cross-trial comparisons and decisions based on safety profiles. And so if I can proffer my own approach at the moment with the data we have today uh, for this complex um, scenario, for those patients in the HER2 negative metastatic space, I think one way of, of triaging these treatments is to, is to offer for those patients who have tumors with IHC 1 plus uh, or 2 plus ish negative, the HER2 low population, trastuzumab deruxtecan based on the Destiny, th Destiny 4 data, and for those with IHC 0, sasituzumab based on Tropics 2. What comes after is an area where we need some help uh, and more research. And, and, and of course, at the present, these are going to be decisions made on an individual basis, weighing risks and benefits. Another area where there is a real unmet need in breast cancer is, is a treatment of brain metastases. And we've seen now in a few different studies that trastuzumab deruxtecan is active for the treatment of patients with HER2 positive breast cancer brain metastases. We've seen response rates ranging from 44 up to 73%. And these are patients who have active CNS uh, metastases. So this is a very challenging population to treat. So it's very exciting to see these kinds of results with systemic therapy. The big question now is, can this drug also work for our patients with HER2 low uh, breast cancer brain metastases? And one of the ongoing trials, the DEBRA trial, does include the HER2 low uh, brain met population in a few of the different cohorts. So it will be really um, uh, important to have a new systemic therapy to offer these patients in the future. And so with that, I'll conclude. I think these new generation ADCs have not only, I think, improved outcomes in the HER2 positive breast cancer population, but they have now allowed us to move on to other populations as well. 
HER2 low is now a targetable subgroup within breast cancer. And TDXD is the first approved ADC for, for this setting. Uh, as we mentioned, this is still an evolving space. I think there's a lot uh, of work we can do with quantitative biomarkers to try and help us uh, select the right patients for this therapy. And of course, there's a lot of excitement about the other potential agents being developed in this space. Uh, definitely, there is a need to understand the mechanisms of resistance and develop novel biomarkers and conduct the right sequencing studies in order for us to really optimize and personalize ADC therapy for our patients. So a lot more work to be done uh, and also a lot more to look forward to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shano. It was brilliant. Not only you reviewed the data, but I think you gave very important insights and also uh, future directions, which are, I think, very important, and probably we can discuss this later. Many questions are coming, so I'm happy, <laughs> but I would encourage you to keep asking questions uh, about any aspect that we are discussing. And now to the last talk, which is more to talk about the biology of her 2 low disease. So I think a particular question to ask at the beginning is, is really her 2 low a subtype of breast cancer? And I think this is a relevant question because this is term is being used constantly as her 2 low being a subtype. Here I have a clear answer. It is not. I think we've seen already uh, data from Paolo, from, from Shano, that does not support her 2 low being her to low being a subtype. But let me try to argue uh, a little bit more of this from a biological perspective. Actually, I would argue that even her 2 positive disease is not a subtype. And this is uh, our own work uh, published uh, eight years ago where we compared the biological features of HER2 negative disease versus HER2 positive disease within each of the intrinsic subtypes, within luminal A's, within luminal B's, HER2 rich and basal. And we look at many different data types, gene expression, methylation, copy number. At the end of the day, what we saw is that there are very minor biological differences between a HER2 positive tumor and a HER2 negative tumor when you account for subtype. And actually, these small differences that you see here, 0.3%, 0.2%, percent are basically ex overexpression or amplification of the HER2 uh, amplicon uh, area, 70, 70 uh, chromosome 17q12, uh, 21 amplicon, which is definitely overexpressed or amplified in the HER2 positive, but not in the HER2 negative. But the rest of the biology is exactly the same. So HER2 positive disease is not a biological entity, and therefore HER2 low as well. The other question to ask is, what is the underlying biology of her 2 low disease when we look at intrinsic subtype. And here you can see the distribution of the intrinsic subtypes in IHC0, in IHC1+, or 2+, not amplified. This is work led by Francesco Schettini, who's here in front of me. And as you can see, there is a lot of biological heterogeneity. You can see luminal A's, luminal B's, her rich and basals. One question that I get many times is, are HER2 low tumors HER2 rich? Are HER2 low tumors driven by uh, HER2? And the answer is no. You can see clearly here HER2 rich. Usually we use the pink color for subtyping. Here it's, uh, it's brown or orange. And you can see that in general HER2 rich the proportion doesn't change whether you're IC0, 6%, 4% here, and 3%. So definitely HER2 low disease is not enriched for the HER2 rich subtype. Actually, the vast majority of tumors are luminal A, dark blue, or luminal B. What we do see is that the basal likes tend to be more prevalent in the IHC0, almost 50% in this group, and less prevalent in IHC1 plus and 2 plus. And the opposite happens with the luminal A's, luminal B's. Luminal A's and luminal B's tend to be more prevalent in the HER2 low disease than in the IHC0. Here you see the distribution of the subtypes in the HER2 positive space. And here clearly the HER2 rich subtype comes up as representing almost 50% of HER2 positive tumors. But again, HER2 positive tumors have luminal A, luminal B, and even basal like tumors. That's why I try to argue that HER2 positive is not a biological entity. Another important aspect, and let me try to argue that uh, HER2 low disease is not a subtype, is that once you account for HOMO receptor status, then you see that this is really the driver of the biological features of HER2 low disease. This is, again, analysis that we reported uh, last year, combined analysis of many different data types summarized here. What you can see is the PAM50 genes, so looking for blood proliferation, expression of RBB2, expression of luminal genes, 
according to HER2 zero versus HER2 low and according to homo receptor status, so homo receptor positive here and triple negative. And you can see that the HER2 low cases cluster right with the HER2 zero cases. And what's really driving this separation is homo receptor status. And actually, I would argue that even within triple negative disease, you see that the, there is a lot of uh, homogeneity between the two groups. Whereas in ER positive, there is slight differences between the two groups, but definitely far away from the triple negative uh, space. Interestingly, when we look at RBB2 mRNA levels across these four groups, so again, HOMO receptor positive, whether it's HER2 zero, HER2 low, triple negative, HER2 zero, HER2 low, you see that in general, HOMO receptor positive tumors tend to have higher levels of RBB2 mRNA compared to triple negatives, whether they are HER2 low or not. At the same time, we observe that within HOMO receptor positive, HER2 negative, if you're HER2 low, you seem to have lower proliferation compared to the other groups. These are relative changes. From an absolute perspective, this is not huge, but relatively speaking, there is lower proliferation. And at the same time, you see the opposite for the luminal genes. The luminal genes seem to be higher in the HER2 low ER positive compared to the ER uh, positive HER2 zero. And this is an interesting observation that has been confirmed, as Paolo showed uh, at the beginning, with this observation. This observation is looking at IC and looking at the proportion of HER2 low tumors once you increase the, or once you look at the higher expression of ER. And you can see that the HER2 low category increases once you increase ER. So there is this relationship that also at the protein level, not only at the mRNA, is, is quite clear. So if hopefully I have convinced you, if not, we can discuss this uh, later. The second question to ask is the activity of TDX different according to home receptor status? No? We're seeing that even within HER2 low, being ER negative, ER positive matters a lot from a biological perspective. The question is, is this drug uh, active differently in these two groups? Uh, let's review the data. This was the initial, some of the initial data from uh, Shannon's uh, phase one study, uh, looking at TDX uh, monotherapy in HER2 low disease. Small numbers overall, but here there was a tendency to see that in home receptor positive, which in general I showed you, they have more expression of RBB2 mRNA they had more overall response, higher overall response, 40% versus triple negative. Small numbers, but a hint toward that that could, be, that could be related to the drug efficacy. However, when we look at the Destiny 04 uh, data, we see that this is not the case. It is true that in Destiny 04, the HER2 lows triple negative, uh, they, uh, sorry, the HER2 lows home receptor negative, the triple negative, they behave differently from the ER positives. The PFS in the control arms or the OS is lower than in the home receptor positive. But the efficacy of the treatment is very similar, whether you are ER positive or ER negative. The response rate, the hazard ratio for PFS, and the OS, very similar. So here, we don't see differences uh, of the activity of the drug based on home receptor status. One important aspect, I think, to, to highlight is that the distribution of subtypes I showed you at the beginning were based on primary disease. We're definitely in ER positive space. The luminals predominate, luminal A's and luminal B's. And the non-luminals, the heart and rich and the basal, represent less than 10%, approximately. But the question is, what about the intrinsic biology of Destiny 04? Would this, if we would do profiling of Destiny 04, we would see this distribution, or would we see a different distribution? Again, Destiny 04 is different po patient population, advanced disease that have received several therapies, including endocrine therapy and chemotherapy. Would this be uh, translated? I think this is an open question. But we do have some data suggesting that subtype changes. And in particular, in ER positive or to negative, the non-luminals go up. The proportion of non-luminals go up as tumor evolves. Here is not 28 cases. It's more than 3,000 uh, cases. This is primary disease, classical distribution. Luminal A's, luminal B's predominate, less than 10% of non-luminals. Now we have data on the advanced disease. For example, the data we reported across the Mona Lisa 2, 3, and 7 studies, more than 1,000 patients, showing that now the non-luminals represent 15%, and in some studies they go up to 20 or 25%. So now we go from less than 10% in primary disease of non-luminals to a first line, second line setting of non-luminals becoming one out of four patients. And here I'm showing you our own uh, data set, not published, uh, so hopefully we'll be able to show that in a conference. 28 patients with biopsies performed after CDK forensics inhibition. 
And here you see the distribution of the subtypes. Small numbers, I know, but here, quite striking, you see that the hard to reach subtype, the non-luminals, become more than 50%. Of course, this needs to be confirmed with more studies, but does suggest that as ER positive, HER2 negative tumors evolve under pressure and progressing, they become non-luminal. So potentially the population from a biological perspective with seeing destiny 4 is not what we expect in early disease. There are probably more non-luminal tumors uh, in, that, in that particular study. This is a hypothesis. Also, we need to take into account that we know that at the DNA level, there are changes between primary and metastatic disease. And here is just looking at simple somatic mutations in primary versus metastatic disease. One of them is increases in ESR1 mutations. This is known. But here we like to highlight the acquisition of HER2 mutations in metastatic disease versus primary disease. This is now a common event that happens, not in, not in many patients, but it does happen. And I do think this is important because this is related to the potential activity of this drug that has been shown in lung cancer. And also we like to highlight that this particular acquisition of HER2 mutations is seen across all subtypes, but in particular in, in lobular cancer and in pleomorphic lobular cancer, this is an event that is not 5%, it can go up to 20%. So potentially there might be patients that today we're calling HER2 low, that we might treat them with TDX, that have an underlying HER2 mutation. This is things to still um, understand. Another aspect is the chemotherapy component of, uh, of this drug and how the underlying biology might respond to this chemotherapy component, which, as you know, is called the payload, which is, in this case, exatecan. We don't have much data with TDX, but we do have some data with another ADC that targets another protein, which is HER3, <laughs> but has the same chemo and the same amount of chemo, which is patritumab deruxtecan. And here, let me show you a study that we presented um, last uh, San Antonio uh, and, ESMO, and ESMO breast as well. This is a window of opportunity study to try to understand what are the potential mechanisms of sensitivity and resistance to drugs like this one. This is a study we perform uh, at the SALTI network in Spain. This is uh, patients were recruited who were pre- or post-menopausal. Tumors had to have at least one centimeter in tumor size. In this part A, all tumors were ER positive, HER2 negative, and two thirds were HER2 low, as expected. K67 had to be at least 10% by local assessment, and these patients had not received any prior therapy. So these are newly diagnosed patients with early disease. We allocated patients into four different cohorts according to the levels of HER3, and a single dose was given of this drug, and then we had a biopsy, a mandatory biopsy at day 21. What we observe and when we look at what are the baseline features associated with more response at day 21 are features that we know are associated with more chemosensitivity. In particular, the few non-luminal tumors that we identified in this cohort of ER positive HER2 negative, they responded more at day 21 compared to luminal A's and compared to luminal B's. And those tumors that have higher risk of relapse, meaning more proliferation, less luminal, they responded more. So again, this is the classical picture we would see with, I would say, any chemotherapeutic. This is a classical biology associated with chemotherapy sensitivity. So nothing different from what we know about chemotherapy. Interestingly, also, there is data uh, of uh, this drug. Again, the same amount of chemo and the same chemo as TDX in her 2 positive space in a very late line uh, setting. These patients, small numbers, I know, 14 patients, but these patients were treated with different lines of therapy. None of them received TDX uh, prior to, this, uh, to, this, to, to giving this drug, but the activity to me is quite uh, promising, 43%, suggesting that potentially HER2 positive disease, which is plenty, is full of the proportion of HER2 and region and luminal disease is very high, is highly sensitive to this particular chemotherapeutic uh, agent. Food for thought. Another uh, question to ask is, is the activity of TDX different according to HER2 expression? This is data, early data from, from Shannon, published in, in the New England in uh, 2020, looking at the overall response of IC3 plus of TDX versus 1 plus or 2 plus each uh, positive. I know this is not the HER2 low space, this is HER2 positive, but you do see at least there was a tendency, small numbers I know, that potentially the 1 plus, 2 plus, despite being HER2 positive, they had a lower overall response compared to 3 plus. All the differences 
are not huge. Within the hard to low space, the question is, does one plus versus two plus matter in terms of activity? The answer clearly is no. Again, going back to Destiny 04 data, if we look at overall response, there's no differences between one plus and two plus. And when we look at a hazard ratio for disease progression, no differences, the hazard ratios are extremely uh, similar. So there's no hint here that knowing if you're one plus or two plus might guide whether you might benefit more or less to this, to this therapy. Shannon also mentioned this uh, study, which I think is, uh, is uh, a study that uh, gives us a lot of thinking about this. A study that included the, the DAISY trial from Unicancer included patients that are HER2 positive, 68 patients, patients with 1 plus or 2 plus each negative, HER2 low, and also included this cohort of 37 patients with HER2 IHC zero. Of course, it's very difficult with these numbers to compare, but clearly the HER2 positives, they respond, patients respond much more, 70%. The HER2 low, almost 40%. And this group right here, they seem to be quite similar to this group, but there is some tendency to show that maybe they respond less. The overall response is a little bit lower. No complete responses were observed in this group, whereas there were complete responses here and here. And also you see more orange and uh, red here. Again, tendency, but it does suggest that potentially within the HER2 zeros, not everybody might benefit. And the question is, who does and who doesn't. But I do think we need more data, and as pointed out, Destiny 04, Destiny 06 will definitely uh, answer this. The DAISY investigators have done an amazing work uh, collecting samples from this trial on treatment progression. This is just one piece of evidence that they've shown. Here, what they're looking at is, is, is on the same slide, they're looking at the staining of HER2, and at the same time, staining of the presence of the drug TDX on the tumor. And what they see is that if you have HER2, substantial amount of HER2 expressed, you do de detect the drug there, the drug is there. Whereas in those tumors, three cases, you know, the, the numbers are small, but in three cases, in two of them, clearly there was no HER2 presence at the protein level at this, by this assay, and TDX was not detected in these patients. There's a hint here to suggest that maybe at some point you don't have enough HER2 expression to really allow the drug to bind to the tumor and be there. But again, we need, we need more data on that. And I do think we need other technologies, as pointed out before, to really measure the HER2 levels. IHC has a lot of limitations. Reproducibility is an issue. We can discuss that. And definitely we need better ways to do that, not only from a standardization point of view, but also as a way to really look at the dynamic range of this, of this marker. This is data looking at transcriptomics, mRNA expression. This is data very similar to what Dr. Modi showed using proteomics, which is another way. The data is very consistent whether you use proteomics or mRNA. What you can see is that first there is a huge dynamic range of HER2 expression in breast cancer. Here you can see this huge dynamic range. We're talking about 16-fold difference uh, across breast cancer. HER2 uh, 3+, plus is the one that shows the highest range of expression. Also, uh, Dr. Modi showed that at the protein level. And there's a huge difference in terms of gene expression between the 2 plus fish positive and the 3 plus. With, these are the groups that we call HER2 positive. So today with HER2 positive, the range of expression is huge in this group. In the HER2 low, you, you kind of do not really see that. You can clearly see that the 1 plus and 2 plus is negative. The difference from an absolute perspective is lower. There is a difference, but it's very, very low. Uh, or small from an absolute perspective. And then you have the HER2 zeros, which are not that far away, as you can see from a mRNA perspective and also from a protein perspective, as HER2 uh, low disease. If we derive a potential cut point to define what's clinically HER2 positive according to the ASCO CAP guidelines, and there's ways to measure and to uh, uh, really calculate a cut point with very high AUCs of 0.98 or 0.99, basically said that. I think we can start seeing and asking questions. One question is, sorry, here. One question is, within HER2 positive disease, those tumors that have very low levels of mRNA, do they respond to anti-HER2 therapies? And the question is, what anti-HER2 therapies? Trastuzumab is one, pertuzumab, but TKIs are different. So what type of anti-HER2 therapies? But do they respond? I think this is a fair question to ask. The other question is within clinically HER2 negative disease, these cases that we see expression by other methods that look more like a HER2 positive, do these patients respond to anti HER2 therapies? Again, we need this data. This is the data that I mentioned before within 
HER2 negative, if you HER2 low, you do have more expression of RBV2 than in HER2 zero. But this is from a relative perspective. From an absolute perspective, this difference is very, very small, looking at mRNA uh, levels. So there are different assays there. This is just uh, one example uh, that I'm involved with all my conflict. But I do want to share this with you, because I do think there is data being presented at ESMO. And I think this could be applicable to other approaches. Now that we have these quantitative methods that can really determine in a larger dynamic range what is the status of HER2, we can really tease out where the biology of the tumor is. In particular, this assay has been developed to, with particular cut points that determine what's low expression versus intermediate versus high expression, with very high AUCs, as I mentioned before, 0 0.96. And always, and this is something that has been shown across many different studies, within clinically hard to positive disease, there's always 10 to 20% of tumors that by other methods, proteomics or mRNA, they look just like a HER2 negative tumor. They don't look like a HER2 positive tumor. And this is very consistent across different studies. And actually, this is data that will be presented uh, at ESMO. Uh, since the abstracts are released, I'm sharing that uh, with you. RB to mRNA, and these specific cut points have been tested in this cohort of patients treated with TDM1, another AD ADC, as you know, that has been widely used for many years. In these studies, this is metastatic disease. 10% were classified as being RBB2 mRNA low. And this group, the responses were 0% to TDM1. And the outcome from a PFS perspective and from an OS perspective was quite uh, poor. One out of 10 patients, but these patients do not benefit from this uh, treatment. At the same time, on Monday, Valentina Guarnieri will present these results uh, looking at another treatment strategy, trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and letrozole, no chemo, just dual blockade and letrozole, in patients that have HER2 positive and homoreceptor positive disease. Here, the proportion of RBB2 mRNA low is higher than 10%, it's 25%, one out of four patients. And none of them, among the 12 patients, none of them achieve a pathological complete response after five cycles of this therapy. Whereas those patients with tumors that were had very high levels of mRNA expression, the overall response or the PCR response was 50%. So again, even within her 2 positive disease, knowing transcriptomics might help better distinguish who is responsible or not. And there is a subgroup of patients that, although they are classified as clinically her 2 positive, they should be probably classified as being her 2 negative. So my take home messages are as following. HER2 status is not a subtype. Hopefully, I convince you. If not, let me know. It is just a biomarker, a very useful biomarker, no doubt, but it's not, uh, it, do it does not identify a subtype. Home receptor status is critical and is a main driver of the biology of HER2 low uh, breast cancer. Home receptor status does not seem to be the driver today with the data we have of response to TDX, so it doesn't seem to matter. However, I would like to point out that the clinical context where this home receptor status is uh, performed is important. I do think so. The intrinsic biology changes in primary disease versus metastatic and at different times during the metastatic process. So I think we need to do more studies to really understand that. That the chemotherapy component seems highly active in ER positive with this non-luminal genomic profile. That these are the tumors that are more chemosensitive and also in HER2 positive disease. It is, unclear, it is unclear today if the activity of TDX varies based on HER2 IHC expression. In general, HER2 positive tumors seem to respond more, no doubt. The overall response, PFS and OS, in HER2 positive uh, of TDX is, is, is much more than what we see for HER2 low disease. But the question is, how low can we go uh, to really um, have activity of this drug? HER2 IHC is not reproducible. We have an issue here, and a very important issue that was, is an issue that we already have in HER2 positive disease. When we run clinical trials and we centralize samples, and 20% of tumors are not confirmed to be HER2 positive uh, centrally. So we have an issue in HER2 positive disease. I think now we have a bigger issue for HER2 low uh, disease. I do believe that other uh, platforms should allow us to better um, uh, identify uh, the, the true biology and the expression of HER2. I do believe that mRNA can be one of them. It can be standardized. I think this is precision oncology. We want a result that is reliable no matter where you do it. And I think there is already substantial data suggesting that these new technologies can not only have a, a better way to look at the dynamic range of HER2, but also identify patients that do not benefit to drugs like TDM1 or trastuzumab, pertuzumab. So with that, we're going to move to the last section. We have. Uh, 
a little bit more than 15 minutes to have a, a nice discussion. Here we have a case that we can start discussing. This is a 50-year-old woman with metastatic homoreceptor positive HER2 negative non-amplified breast cancer. She received two lines of endocrine therapy and one line of chemo, capecitabine, and the patient unfortunately progressed. So, Shannon, Paolo, let's, let's discuss some things. Do you need more information before recommending further therapy or not? I think the audience was very clear with the answer, but would any type of clinical information of this case would change your mind regarding the next line of therapy? I mean, I think in the days before Destiny 4, uh, probably not. Um, but now that we have the Destiny 4 data, I mean, I think it's we're putting a lot of work back on our pathologists to now focus on 1 plus, 2 plus, and really trying to, as best they can with IHC, define the status, the expression status, the HER2 expression status of the tumors. I think the only other bit of information that's important, of course, is to know that the patient is not uh, doesn't have a contraindication to receive trastuzumab dirextecan, and we did talk a little bit about the ILD risk, so you want to make sure uh, this is not someone in particular that has baseline pneumonitis. That's a you know an, a known risk factor for subsequent pneumonitis, but otherwise, I think the the key is to know the actual HER2 expression of the tumor. Yes, Thank I totally you. agree. Comorbidities are key in this case. And since I don't see the IHC level over 2, that's also key here because knowing if the tumor is HER2 low, IHC 1 plus or 2 plus is negative, or HER2 zero, as Dr. Modi noted, can really change the algorithm here because if the tumor is HER2 low, you can think of proposing TDXD where this is available, whereas in the absence of that, you, can, you have chemotherapy or sasituzumab, govitikan, although that was tested in later lines. There are questions coming in. I know we don't have a section, but there is a question related that I think it's important, and I'm sure this question will come up, is, um, no, as you pointed out, we need to know the HER2 status, right? And let's say that this case is HER2 zero in the metastatic biopsy, but this patient had a, uh, a breast cancer years ago, and that uh, biopsy showed uh, to be HER2 low. In other words, the primary archival was HER2 uh, low. Now the biopsy performed at progression to capecitabine is uh, HER2 zero. How would you, could that change your, your mind regarding uh, TDX? I, I think this is probably the most common question <laughs> I've been asked since the Destiny 4 data were released, this, this discordance. And, and I think Paolo made, a, he put his nickel down already, and I, I think I'm, I feel the same way. So I think any, any uh, biopsy, whether primary or late line, for me that shows one plus or two plus would be, I think, sufficient. Just given the, all the body of data that we have today about this drug and, and other studies. Um, and, and, you know, these decisions are individualized, of course. You want to see what other options you have for that patient. But, you know, in the Destiny Breast 04 trial, we were looking for one plus or two plus non-amplified cases, and that was done on one sample. And, and although we requested the most recent metastatic biopsy, that wasn't possible in all cases. So in fact, a third of the samples we received were from primary tumors. Uh, and so you can, you can imagine those, those patients may have had subsequent biopsies where you know the, the IHC status may have been zero. And so, um, I, I think from my perspective, if you have any sample that at some point shows one plus or two plus, uh, and particularly bringing in the DAISY data, uh, there's a lot of compelling reasons to, to think about TDXD. Yes, I totally agree. I think that right now we have a problem, as you noted, with immunohistochemistry is not the right assay to evaluate lower to expression, but we don't have to have this problem impact the way we treat patients in a wrong way because we have a drug that prolongs overall survival and in that setting we don't have so many drugs that prolong overall survival and so you don't want to deny that to a patient that can derive benefit to it. Okay. Very good, very clear. Let's make it a little bit more difficult. Let's imagine that uh, this case was again the chival primary tumor was HER2 zero. Now a new biopsy performed is HER2 zero. Would you revisit the status of, of this uh, case? Uh, do you think there's a space to revisit and, and change uh, that? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, that becomes a, a judgment and is a biopsy safe for the patient? I mean, again, we have a very 
uh, active drug with survival advantage. So there's a lot of compelling reasons to uh, want to know for sure if this is a drug this patient could potentially benefit from. So I think if it's a safe biopsy, we definitely discuss it with the patient. Yep. Yes, I agree. And one important thing we don't know yet is if the site of biopsy can impact the positivity, because we have seen this with PDL1. There are some sites in the body where it's more, you're more likely to find a positive value with PDL1, and other sites like liver where it's less likely. And we don't know yet if that's the case with HER2, but that might really have a, a huge impact in the way we treat our patients. And I think another variable is what you showed, Paolo, no? the data you looking at the reproducibility among pathologies, right? And the data uh, does suggest that pathologies are not reproducible in this particular space or the reproducibility is very low. So I would even think that if you would send the sample to another pathology app, it could then become from HER2-0 to, zero to one plus. So this is the situation that we are facing, is the reality. So again, it makes things even more, more complicated. I think we've covered some of things, but one would be what is the role of her to expression switching during tumor evolution? And Paolo uh, has uh, shown data regarding this, and we've discussed the implication from a therapeutic perspective. How should uh, ILD associated with TDX be managed outside of clinical trials? This is another important uh, topic. Another important topic that uh, Shannon also talked about is the activity of TDX in her to low triple negative versus acetuzumab, right? And where to choose one or the other if the decision can be made, whether to choose. Uh, a TDX versus uh, SASI, based on the current data, what would be your preferred uh, treatment of choice? Will HER2 IC levels matter at the end of TDX? We're waiting for Destiny 06. Potentially, it, they might not matter much. In clinical practice, should maintenance endocrine therapy be given if HER2 low hormone receptor positive if TDX is stopped due to toxicity? No data that is being done in practice, for example. Can we ask that? Anyway, many different things. I don't know, Shano, Paolo, you want to start with one particular of these topics? I think just one probably, which is ILD. And we cannot stress enough how important it is to be aware about the risk of ILD and that about 10 to 15% of the patient receiving TDXD might end up experiencing interstitial lung disease. Most of the cases are low grade and most of the cases are actually asymptomatic. So grade one only radiologically detected. But even in the presence of only radiologically detected, it is important to stop the drug and administer steroids which is the, the key treatment for interstitial lung disease. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, uh, I, you know, our earliest experience with ILD was in the HER2 positive arena with Destiny 1, and we did see, un unfortunately, a 2.5% a, a rate of, of grade 5 events. Uh, but I think that's what prompted the mass education campaign to try and raise awareness, both to clinicians and patients, of the importance of, of monitoring patients when they're on this therapy. And I know we all saw wonderful results from Destiny 3 where they haven't seen the high-grade events. So uh, I think that shows us that we, we can, uh, with good monitoring and being proactive, deliver this drug safely. But I think there's uh, always, uh, we need to remind everyone not to become complacent about this risk. Uh, it is a real risk, and but 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 it's something that we we've done in oncology many times. You know, we've learned how to give important therapies with uh, with uh, high levels of toxicity safely to the patients who need them. So um, I think Destiny Three de definitely shows us we we can do that. And then I actually would like to hear your idea regarding endocrine treatment because we have seen that most of our more receptor positive HER2 non amplified tumors are luminal tumors, and so should endocrine treatment be given together with TDXD. Destiny Breast 04 didn't do that, but do you think there is a rationale for that? I think there is a rationale. It is true that since the study did not um, allow the use of endocrine therapy, it gives us a little bit of thought, but we can go to the Cleopatra study, no? her two positive, and I think, at least I do, and I think many people do, uh, we use endocrine therapy in that, in that setting. We're not gonna have a trial, I think, to really <laughs> tease out you know, whether endocrine therapy adds anything, but I do think that in those cases that you stop the toxicity, uh, endocrine therapy could be uh, administered. But again, I don't have really data, but uh, I would be cautious, to, I, I would be uh, interested to see, you know, for example, you, Shannon, that you've used probably the drug better, or if you know, for example, in the US versus Europe, if people are using endocrine therapy as a maintenance, or, or even in combination with... You know, I, I think right now, clinically, we're using it mostly in the HER2 positive population. Yeah. Um, and so, 
typically we're using the drug up till the, the point of, a, of, of progression, I think. We, we may have those cases where someone has to stop TDXD for toxicity, for example, and if there is a ear positive disease, I think there's a clear, uh, you know, a maintenance or a new therapy, frankly, to offer. We, as you mentioned in Cleopatra, they didn't really um, allow for that in the maintenance setting, although it's become a widely adopted pattern of practice. Uh, we've seen it in other trials where people have allowed maintenance endocrine therapy. There's very little downside is what I would say. So I, I would definitely support that. Okay. We have a, a question from the audience. Again, if somebody wants to stand up and ask questions, please do. It says here, uh, very few patients previously treated with immunotherapy. I imagine it's talking about triple negative disease and probably destiny of four. Would this option of treatment still be considered uh, in this particular scenario, triple negative patients that have progressed to immunotherapy, would that TDX uh, data would be applicable here? And what is the impact of trastuzumab deluxtecan in uh, BRCA and mutation population? So there, there was a very small percentage of patients on Destiny 4. It was about 20%, probably all from the hormone receptor negative cohort yep. that had IO therapy before coming on to the Destiny Breast 04 trial. Um, <clears throat> I, I, so I can't tell you if they had any different. We haven't looked at whether they performed differently. It's a small population, of course. Um, but, but we have already studies that show the safety of combining TDXD with checkpoint inhibitors. And actually, there's a lot of interest in that combination for the triple negative HER2 low population. So um, I, I, I think this is going to be a very interesting uh, combination for the future. Um, again, it was a small group of BRCA positive patients uh, in the Destiny 4 trial, a small number. And I, I, I won't be able to give you, you know, if they performed any differently uh, with TDXD. But there's really no, I think, um, reason to suspect uh, they would they would perform uh, biologically that much differently. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shannon. I think with TDXD, we're learning that we need to learn from other diseases. For instance, in lung cancer, we've seen that the MER2 mutation might sensitize to TDXD, and now we're testing this in breast cancer. And I think also for, for the ILD perspective, it was interesting to see a pooled analysis by Dr. Powell and colleagues recently published on ESMO Open. And then they did an exploratory analysis where it didn't seem TDXD after immunotherapy to have increased toxicities. And that was other diseases. It was gastric cancer, it was lung cancer. But in general, I feel that we can learn from other diseases. And that seemed to be safe. So I think also the combination has been safe in Begonia, another trial. So I feel that it can be used definitely after immunotherapy. Very good point. Thank you. Another question, there are many questions regarding no, how to measure HER2, other methods. Um, we cannot address all of them, apologies, but I think one is, uh, how do you think pathologic assessment variability has an impact on HER2 zero versus HER2 low shifts observed between primary metastatic disease? I'll start. Uh, I, I do think we don't know the exact percentage uh, of that. Uh, I do think it's a high percentage uh, that much of these changes we're seeing are basically uh, lack of reproducibility. Um, the data in JAMA uh, oncology does suggest that, uh, with 26% concordance among pathologies. So uh, I would see that in the community, this percentage is, is, even, is even higher. So here we have a, an issue, as, as we said. Um, at the same time, there is a question here that says, um, what should be the minimum threshold for her to expression responding to the X? I don't think we don't have the, the answer today. Uh, right now, we can say that the her 2 low as defined by Destiny 04 uh, benefits uh, compared to the standard of care. How low can we go? I think this is a question that we, we need to address. Destiny 06 will provide data. DAISY also will provide. We're probably going to need more studies, but I'm, I'm not so sure. Destiny 06 with 150 patients, was it? Uh, 150 yes. patients is going to really tease out because that group might be more heterogeneous. Some patients might benefit or not. So again, at the end of the day, it could be that any expression, no? any brown staining uh, is enough. And that would definitely be basically all <laughs> breast cancers. Yeah. As we use yeah. sesotuzumab, you know, without yeah. uh, measuring trope 2, although yeah. I think there are some nice studies that show the higher the trope 2 expression, the more benefit from sesotuzumab. So I, I do think we need to uh, spend the effort to determine that. Uh, particularly as we're going to see so many ADCs in the future with overlapping populations, as I suggested, we're going to need better ways 
to to determine you know how to select these uh, for for that particular patient. Mm -hmm. So we're running out of time, unfortunately. I think we could be talking here for hours about this topic. Uh, I do think that more data is coming, and I think it's going to help allow to better you know answer some questions that right now. We don't, we don't have that, that data to, to support it. Uh, I want to thank both of you. I think I've had a great time in the last month preparing this, this session. You've done an amazing work. Also, all of you for, for attending. I think this is an exciting uh, field. Uh, no doubt that HER2 is an important target. Uh, now we're seeing that many more patients beyond HER2 positive benefit from anti-HER2 therapies like, like TDX. So I think this is the beginning of an era where definitely we're, we're going to see more agents in this population and more patients benefiting. Thank you very much. Thank you. This activity is certified by PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Remember to download the slides and practice aids.